Okay, folks, uh, if I might have your attention. My name is uh, Brad Hessel, and I am the treasurer of the Wake Healthy Wake County Libertarian Party. And uh, tonight we have a special program. It's the last of a series of five presentations on issues that are relevant to the 2016 uh, election. Would you kill the volume of yeah. TV, please? Um, we've done uh, four up to now, and each one of them, uh, let's see, we did uh, education, energy, transportation, and uh, the environment, right, not energy, the environment and uh, reform, electoral reform. Those are all on our YouTube channel, if anyone wants to go back and check them out. Um, this uh, presentation also is being webcast. Uh, thank you, Ken Penkowski, who saved the day because the internet connection here at the May factory went, is, is down. Uh, so we're using a Ken Penkowski hotspot. Uh, so um, if, uh, if you like what, you, what happens here and you want to send it to somebody, you'll be able to send them a link, hopefully, if everything works properly. Uh, what we're going to do is uh, um, my partner in crime here is, uh, and I use the word crime advisedly because we're talking about sending legal activity. Um, is Olin uh, Watson, and uh, he is secretary of the Wake uh, LP. As it happens, each one of us also are candidates for North Carolina General Assembly this November. Uh, he is running for District 38 uh, in the House, and I'm running for District 15 in the Senate. Um, so, um, but that's neither here nor there. Let's get right to it. Um, basically, the format's going to be, Olin's going to talk a bit about alcohol legislation uh, in North Carolina. I'm going to talk a bit about marijuana legislation in North Carolina. Uh, we're going to talk, but if you guys have questions, you know, this is not that formal. Feel free to interrupt. We'll certainly have time for questions afterwards. If you feel more comfortable doing it that way, that's fine. Um, so. Without further ado, take it away. Thank you. Uh, if you all will notice, I'm, I'm going to take a different posture this time. The last time I noticed that um, I looked fat in the video. <laughs> I'm leaning back a little too much, so I think this time I'm going to try to sit up a whole lot better. <laughs> Hope you'll be able to hear me. Um, so, again, this is pot and booze, uh, and no free samples, obviously. Um, um, what I'd like to open up with, we're, we're doing sort of a historical context in a way. Uh, the Volstead Act was, was sort of uh, the Prohibition Act, the, the amendment to the Constitution that prevented folks from not consuming, but only production, distribution, uh, manufacture. So these are the things that the Volstead Act prevented. A lot of people thought you couldn't go to a speakeasy. That wasn't the problem. The problem was the people who would purchase and deliver, and that's what was uh, was made illegal with the uh, the Volstead Act and the amendment to the Constitution. Now, um, Ooh, so I have a question already. Yeah, sure. So, what about all those movies where you see the cops busting into the speakeasy and arresting everybody? Well, so that's the thing. Uh, sales. It was the sale of it was also, but not again just the consumption. So you could have something at your home, but you couldn't make it for yourself. You couldn't uh, go and pick it up at a store. You couldn't buy it from a friend or borrow it from door to door. So buying and selling were illegal? Buying so, and selling uh, So if someone at a speakeasy who had bought a drink would be uh, eligible for arrest. That's, that's correct. That's so they, correct. So they brought their own. Unless they brought their own, yes. But presumably the speakeasy wouldn't be enthusiastic about letting that's you right. in. <laughs> So uh, the Volstead Act is not, it didn't come out of nowhere. Um, there were 19 states at the time of the enactment. 
which was in 1990, I think July of 90. 1919, oh, sorry, 1919, July. Um, it didn't come out of nowhere. There were 19 states that were already considered dry states, most of them in the South and pertaining to North Carolina. Um, we were one of those states at that time. So um, there were a lot of organizations, church organizations, just social welfare organizations uh, that looked at the many uh, problems of drinking, which we understand abuse of alcohol or even abuse of drugs carries their own real natural consequences. Um, so these states had decided to be dry, um, and basically the Volstead Act was the, the nation taking up that and saying, let's, let's do that on a nationwide level. They felt that it would uh, uh, reduce crime, reduce um, dissipation, one of those great old words, right? Uh, it allowed, it, it, there was death associated with, with alcohol abuse. Uh, all those things we understand as adults, the dangers of alcohol and drugs. Uh, the, the country wanted to heal themselves of that. The country at the time was very interested in improving social welfare, moving away from Langston Hughes' uh, The Jungle, uh, review of the meatpacking industry, you know. So um, the idea is we can be this, you know, later term, shining light on a hill, um, and let's do that. They made that decision. Well, the difficulty comes in not 1919, not in 1920, but really within a short seven years, things dramatically changed. The question was, for the good or the better, I think most folks here have watched enough TV to know the answer to that. If anybody, anybody here watched Board, Boardwalk Empire, you watch Old Man. Right here. Um, yeah, so that's a great series if anybody is interested in watching it. Um, so what I have brought tonight in the material I have is actually the um, from April 5th to April 24th, 1926, um, Congress had hearings. Um, and sort of reviewing um, what how things were going. Well, it already in those short five, six years had gone pretty downhill pretty fast. And uh, these hearings was try to say what what is it exactly that we're doing here and how can we sort of remedy the problems that have risen. So. Um, for example, uh, I'd like to read just a, a moment. Uh, there's a representative there, um, and he said, the failure of prohibition under the rigors of the unreasonable Volstead law, and that the only practical proposal for the enforcement of the 18th Amendment is the modification of the Act of Congress so as to permit the sale of beer and light wines. So, so the solution that they were uh, proposing in this moment, and it would not be repealed, at, or you wouldn't have the 26th Amendment, I believe, to, to undo the Volstead Act. Um, it was some years before that would happen, but the effort to modify or mollify those problems was to permit wine and beer to be sold. Not going to hard liquor yet, because, you know, everything would go horribly wrong if we allowed people to drink liquor, right? Uh, but, so they thought, let's maybe try to sell some wine and some beer, all the light stuff, and uh, maybe that'll take care of it. So this, what I have here in those, the, this discussion is about uh, the reasons for that. So um, the reasons, too, is that, or why the Volstead Act didn't work. Uh, sobriety and temperance uh, was obviously the, the hope of the legislation, but it hadn't been approved. Uh, as a matter of fact, death from acute alcoholism had drastically increased. The, the quality of the liquors and beers and wine had become poisonous by uh, Mr. Bear's description. So the courts became congested. Now, the enforcement was problematic, problematic, not just because of the cost of it, but because of the great amount of corruption that had threatened the government because of it. And in general, Mr. Ver uh, states that it actually shattered the respect for law in the state. It had not just contained itself to 
people violating this, the the liquor, the wine uh, prohibition, the beer prohibition, but it actually shattered other people's or people's um, adherence to other laws. So they saw a general increase in crime. The most dramatic, obviously, with the alcohol. Um, actual narcotics use dramatically increased during the period, which is interesting. Folks couldn't get um, uh, a beer or a wine or whatever, so well maybe they could get some heroin. It's like a vanilla nature. So people expanded into other areas, and I think we see today uh, Molly and all these other more dangerous uh, drugs is really uh, people trying to find other ways to get high, and that's what was happening back then. People were try desperately trying to get high one way or another, and they succeeded with disastrous results. So, um, with the some statistics, um, in Philadelphia, it was sort of like the test case. They had the, the gentleman, um, I guess it was the Solicitor General um, from Philadelphia appeared before Congress, and they showed in the years before 1919, there were Two deaths, eight deaths, seven deaths, five deaths. In the year 1919, two deaths. In the year 20, eight deaths. 21, it became 45 deaths. 1922, 54. 23, 65 deaths. And by the year 1925, in just April of that year, 238. So just in one city alone, in a mere five years, you move from eight deaths to 238 deaths. Poison product. Um, some other statistics. Um, in the five years between 1920 and 1925, uh, of cases reported, convictions, acquittals, cases dropped and compromised, it, it rose from six... 1,436 cases to 19,726 cases. If you look at that on a federal level, it went in the same period, it went from 14,000 legal actions from alcohol to 102,000 actions for alcohol. That's a 714% increase. So, um, we see here that almost as soon as the act happens, criminal element is introduced and more uh, apprehensions, more convictions, and just a dramatic amount of more police activity. Of course, for most of the libertarians here, this fully fits in with what we understand about drugs and alcohol. So I'm not really telling you anything new. Yeah, prohibition. Yeah, prohibition in general. It was a, it was a PBS series about prohibition. The North got involved in temperance, especially with the resurgence of it, or not a resurgence, but the surge of um, religious activity in New York under a gentleman named Walter Rauschenbusch in the yeah, Burnover District. Right. It was, the prohibition was driven by religious groups. Sure, there was a bona fide social issue involved before the prohibition. Right. Because it was a very important issue. And people were trying to get out of the prohibition. We know that, that uh, uh, the drugs... People were drinking all the time. They didn't stop drinking. 
Absolutely. Uh, that's that's the very point. In 1919, 1920, you instantly see a rise. And it became pretty dramatic. It was a curve that was very notable. And the stuff wasn't as good. As good. No, it became very poisonous. So the appropriations. So this is where we get back into the more libertarian ideas. We like to lead with our hearts, but also our pocketbooks too, right? 1920, the appropriation for uh, enforcement was three million. Why? Three and three quarters million. But it became ten and three quarters million within those five years. So uh, numbers that we see: death increases by triple, um, cases by seven times sevenfold. Uh, the costs, now this is just the appropriations for enforcement at a federal level, went to triple. A lot of the times in this hearing, you will note, if, and I will provide that to you if you're interested, um, you see that the, the, the representatives and the senators testifying that the cost is really incalculable because they couldn't um, codify what every state, city, local municipality was contributing toward the effort. They couldn't uh, look at the revenue and say, well, we know what tax money was lost in a federal, but we don't know what happened on the state level. And the information didn't flow as easily. But the, the effects were dramatic. Uh, so they actually even compared it to national readiness. Uh, that the cost for enforcement <laughs> basically reflected what we were spending on national defense at the time, which is pretty comedic if you think about the way things are today. Um, so the this is one thing that was important to me socially. I think it's important to consider because we're talking about prohibition today, right? Just of a different substance. Modification of Volstead Law to permit the sale of beer and light wines is needed to protect the youth of our nation. Haven't we heard that, right? The danger to the present hip pocket flask among young girls and boys are recognized everywhere. In my home city, under former conditions, liquor sales to minors were prevented through rigid regulations. Today, the former barriers are removed. The passing of the whiskey flask with its customary poison is the expected event at the usual social gathering of youth. Formerly respectable circles frown at drinking among the adolescents. Today it is the accepted custom only too frequently, and boys and girls regard it as only smart to show their open defiance of the law of the land. Formerly, the monk, young man who brought the bottle of whiskey to a party of girls was ostracized. Today he is regarded as akin to a hero. I think that's what we have today. I, I was a teacher for a couple of years there at Millbrook High School, and the best shirt and the best socks you could wear had a, a marijuana leaf on it, you know. And we tried to make them hide it at least, put a shirt on over that. But we have a situation today where children, children are thinking, my best way to rebel is something that could put me in jail for 20 or 30 years. And that is a scary thing to me. So it was, wouldn't be until 1933 that prohibition was um, prohibition was uh, repealed effectively with the passage um, um, killing the Volstead Act. Uh, but I thought one thing that was interesting is said. Let's see. <coughs> I, I love this line. The, it would salvage many human derelict by providing a healthful beverage. So, even, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you know, isn't that wonderful? That even during the time when we were trying to prevent it as Americans, we recognized that there were health benefits to good wine and good beer. And I think that's the same thing that uh, we're going to see um, comments once we go talk about uh, the drug legalization tonight. So, how does that narrow to where we are today? There's original 19 states that had a dry state. Um, one of the things that this uh, hearing goes on to make the question is, what, should we turn this over to the state? The state should run the production and the distribution of alcohol and beer. And um, it's really wonderful that the senator here says, oh, heck no, <laughs> in that parlance. He says, that he knows of no constitutional basis to allow the government to go into business for anything.
But what do we have here in North Carolina? ABC stores. So it's, I am encouraged by reading this that when I talk to folks of an older generation, I said, you know what your parents said? You know, I can talk about what your parents felt and what they thought and the reason their generation decided prohibition really didn't function well. So it was very enlightening for me. Uh, so we have the ABC system now. The state owns the ability to distribute liquor. Now, beer and wine, and, and you can see this reflection with how this act here, beer and wine became available for people to sell, to distribute. Mm -hmm. But still in North Carolina, we tried to wrangle some control, and we took that un unconstitutional step and said, we're going to distribute and s sell all liquor-based uh, beverages. Sort of how, where we got to today. I have a question. Yeah. Um, we were dry prior to the uh, Prohibition Amendment, and then the amendment was repealed, and the Volstead Act was overturned, and we still had state laws presumably keeping us dry at that point, right? So the ABC stores didn't start right away, right? They were later. Right. So for a while, we re remained dry, is that correct? That's true. I think until maybe about 10 years ago, we had, and we may... I think we may have one county that in North Carolina that's dry at this time. There's, 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 yeah. There are a couple. Target was only um, South Beach, Dry County, within the last years. Fifteen, did you say? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So, as these, in one of the discussions in here, does this, does if we make this federal ruling, how does it change the implementation of state law? Is the state still able to do what they choose to do? And this, the answer that they came to in this is yes, they can still do what they choose to do, which is how North Carolina was able to maintain uh, that dry status for so long. And county at a time, county, county, county by county, um, we've become uh, a wet state. So, or wetter anyway. Wetter, for the most part. Just yeah, go half a county away, and you'll be able to get something. Are there any questions? I just talk, 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 talk. Yeah, Bobby. The first time that there was wide recognition that progressivism doesn't work. Yeah. The idea behind progressivism is that if we change things, we can perfect human existence and make things possible. Absolutely. And the government can control all this and run all this and make it work better. So they put in prohibition to try to improve the human condition and it fell flat on their face. So for the first time, we recognize that progressivism does not work. Doesn't inevitably work. So, and I should point out that at this time, it was a Republican-controlled Congress that had, in 1990 pushed prohibition through, just for sort of party reference of, of that generation. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, so one of the things about Walter Rauschenbusch and his folk is his group, various types of uh, social welfare groups is they had the concept of the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of earth. And they felt that they could actually literally bring the kingdom of heaven to the kingdom of earth. So they really believed that their intention was to purify on a religious ground how to, uh, how to make, remake the country in the image of God. Um, something that was bequeathed to me by, by my father, uh, really an interesting book, from 1918, uh, and it's, it's a student reader uh, that was put out by the National Workers' Party. It uh, has a uh, gold leaf swastika across the front of it. As you read through it, it actually, there's a whole section of it on temperance yeah. and discussing how one does not want to be like the drunkard and how alcohol will weaken the bone and, and make a nation unready. And, and the language that they use, in many ways, being able to look at that language and see how it was that as an argument, it was some sort of a failed argument, and yet for other items today, we see the same modality. Do this, do this is your brain on drugs, you know. It's so let's be careful when we look backwards, like I think uh, Donald Trump's Make America Great Again. Uh, we always had a fair sort of sentiment of socialism, sort of. Uh, authoritarian control in our country. So it's, it's um, there was always that sense somewhere 
And uh, in certain periods, like that period, there was a lot of authoritarian control at that time. So we shouldn't look back and say it was great. Uh, could I get to Phil first? He had his hand up a little while ago. Well, um, from the political point of view, um, a critical reason why the movement, which already existed, was able to make um, the move and, and get the thing passed, was that World War I was underway, and a substantial number of people were disenfranchised by being dragged overseas, conscripted or not, but they were not letting them vote. Uh, in theory, I suppose they would have the right to vote, but nobody overseas was able to vote against prohibition. Right. Or against the, the state legislators who were passing it. This is a neat sub-interest. Um, so, where does alcohol in great part come from? Grains? So during World War I, they wanted to have more grain available for the horses in World War I. That was one of the arguments used to enact uh, the Volstead Act, that we would be more, like you said, Brian, prepared. <clears throat> Neat, huh? Ken. Yeah, um, so I've got an actual question. Um, in North Carolina today, what are the laws that are preventing a freer market in the production and sale and consumption of alcoholic beverages, and what do libertarians want to do to move us closer to that free market? So I would be uh, to represent what libertarians want to do, because we all want to do, we choose to as do. As a candidate, what would you like as, to do? Okay. <laughs> as a candidate, I'd like to see lift the cap. Uh, is any hands, anybody who's familiar with the lift the cap idea? Lift the cap, cap uh, hashtag, they've got a little bit of a Craft Brewers Association. The goal is to uh, lift the cap on distribution. They already lifted the alcohol limit level, so that uh, that's what made North Carolina one of the best brewers in the country at this point. Uh, but now the cap goes to um, can those craft brewers distribute their own product um, and how they distribute it to their own properties. Um, so those are those are the probably for me as a candidate. I would love to see the distribution cap change. So also, there's a limit. There is a limit, yes, sir. And um, I would actually like to see ultimately the this destruction of the ABC. I shouldn't say destruction. We're on the air. Abolition. Um, the abolition. We like that. Yeah. Prohibition. <laughs> the, the we'll prohibit the ABC. Um, yeah, that's that's what I would love to see as as a, as a libertarian. To me, the interim step, the legislative solution that I see right now, is simply changing those distribution laws. We have to see. Uh, have to see. I, actually, camera. Yeah. Uh, point of the past that ties to the future. You we missed one of the big uh, proponents of prohibition yeah. and kept it throughout to various degrees up until today. It's the moonshine. The moonshiners want to benefit from liquor being illegal or even illegal on Sunday. So on Sunday, then they have to, and their uh, Bruce Handel writes his book, and there's a kind of feel that bootleggers, Baptist theories. They actually get together and work on this. So they have a ABC board. The state benefits from that being there, and the dispute on the beer, big corporations, you know, um, Anheuser Busch, you know, all the have the best interest of keeping dis distributors under the state control because they already have their in. So they can't; they're trying to keep out competition. So, a way to look at it for a strategic standpoint is to see who's got the best of interest into it, and this is the way it is. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, bootleggers and Baptists is a great it's for people who want to spread Very the liberty. Fun, fun too. It's a great way to describe why we're sort of stuck in the system, not just for ABC and distribution, but also about the the uh, the illicit drugs. All kinds of all kinds of you know. Joy, you had a question. We're talking about craft dealers. I found this out accidentally. I wanted to have somebody mail me some craft brew another state and was unable to found out that there was a federal law against oh. mailing beer over state lines. I haven't considered that. And the, um, but you can mail one. Yes, and you can mail one. Oh, and liquor. Yeah, uh -huh. you can mail it. You can mail beer. Now, really? You can mail beer. That's interesting. It's probably the alcohol volume. I don't know. 
what would the liberalization of alcohol laws do to the economy of North Carolina overall? Well, already the liberalization has created, <laughs> a, what is it, almost a billion dollars in the first couple years of, of revenues for North Carolina. And the obvious tax revenues that go to not just the people who have now jobs and businesses and supporting their family, but um, it's been a dramatic boom in taxes for the state of North Carolina. So, and that was just raising the alcohol limit on beer. That was not some dramatic undoing the ABC. It wasn't uh, changing the distribution laws. It, there's so many things that weren't changed. Just that one little thing created nearly a billion dollars of, of uh, liquid assets in North Carolina. So if we were by extension to apply the release of distribution, uh, there would be more competition in distribution. We would be able to access these products at, at lower prices. More people could go into businesses for themselves, supporting their families, employing more people. Um, the state would undoubtedly collect more in taxes happen um, and, and increase competition. It helps all consumers. Is that a reasonable question? Answer That's a great, great answer. Thank you. So what government learned and actually applied I'm later. sorry, Steve, you said government learned, right? <laughs> no, well, government did learn in this case. But government learned that when it bans something, it creates a greater need for itself. And they learned it from prohibition from other things that they banned later on in the line that, okay, if we're going to ban something, make sure ahead of time we've got the resources to be able to enforce that ban. And they learned it from prohibition later on for drugs when they finally banned marijuana and some of the other stuff. And even to like smaller laws today when they ban something, they figured out now through prohibition, you can't just ban something without being prepared to enforce it. Well, the, I would extend your comments to the idea of syntax. The, the implication of syntax is if you discourage that behavior by the syntax, you ultimately destroy your revenue base. So <laughs> what you were paying for with that syntax, once it becomes uh, maybe a black market or something, we shouldn't call it a mar black market. What's the phrase we use instead of black market? Free market. Free market, there you go. Um, then you know it destroys that income base. Once we try to jack those prices up, there's all always peripheral effects that you really can't calculate. You can't look to instantly. Bobby, you had a. Uh, I think some of the people weren't here for the original discussion about beer distribution, so it might be helpful to explain a little bit of this. Uh, let's say Gourmet Factory opened up another location, and at their other location it was bigger, and they put in. A brewery, and they were making beer at that location. Export beer from that location to this location. It has to go through a state-approved distributor, and of course, there are only three state-approved distributors, and they will talk to a small organization. So the small organizations are locked out and are unable to distribute their beer because of government regulations. There is no problem with distribution, except the legislature is in the way. The small the small breweries could easily distribute their products if the government would get out of the way. I do know that uh, there's a brewery in Charlotte that basically gave up their distributorship. So anybody that wants their beer, they have to drive to Charlotte to pick it up. Wow. <laughs> well, maybe I'm, I'm sorry, what's your name? Uh, Sarah. Sarah? Oh, this is Sarah. Sarah's got so could you then not make uh, an argument for, I guess, a, a smaller you know, change in that would it solve the problem to just make those distributors more easily accessible by small um, by small uh, breweries or to just allow for an exemption in that case? So I think uh, sometimes we get in the habit of just being plainly philosophical in these meetings. Uh, I, I, I appreciate your question. It's really about how do we move forward from where we are? Is that really how do we do that? I think we don't have to remove the distribution laws instantly. We could focus as a, a, a party on how, just raising the cap so that uh, a beer, Red Oak, could get larger and distribute more of their own before they would have to enter into that contract. 
and hopefully the mo the economic momentum created by that small step would be instructive to the state to say, hey, we could great gain more revenue if we just continued to increase that cap. So legislative position questions are very much more important than than uh, philosophical questions in some regards. Susan. How about we focus on removing the cap and the compromise position of the legislature might be to increase the cap. Um, so yes, it depends on how you would say focus. For me, long-term focus versus short-term focus. My short-term focus is uh, is to have 20 bucks in my pocket if my wife gets lets me. Um, but my long-term focus is to be able to vacation in Bali. You know, um, I have to do these short-term things to get there. And I believe that when we do smaller legislative steps that actually prove the issue then we smooth the way for greater legislative work without having to fight so much. You know, definitely that a, way, a tactic is if you do things like lessen the regulation and increase the cap and make it, make it easier to do things in law, at some point in time, it will no longer be a state, a state will no longer have get any function, have any need any revenue from their regulation because it will be so minimal that all but this is going to be still on the books technically but um, not not profitable so well, I think good ideas prove themselves okay if if our ideas as val as libertarians are valuable and are truly good ideas we can be satisfied with making smaller steps because it should, in theory, prove itself and encourage our population to make more steps in these directions. The need to take the incremental steps is based on the idea that there's resistance. Is there an organization currently who is sort of keeping track of who's in favor of allowing these companies to move and who's not? And what are the arguments of the people who are not? I am not familiar with the organizations that are, but the Craft Brewers Association is very active in trying to move the ball politically. Yeah, so Cameron, you mentioned the opposition, the bootleggers and the Baptists, right? Yeah, so I mean, it's in experience, anybody has kind of a financial interest or a Happens, it? it would be your Anheuser Bushes, um, your uh, your bootleggers, and a lot of I mean, those, those individuals who have a natural desire to protect their market, right. those individuals are not sitting in Jones Street except as lobbyists. Right. Who are the people they're talking to? They're not sitting in Jones Street. They're funding the people who are sitting. And it's and well, and you know, uh, you know, the earth is not dying and being killed. And those who are killing it have names and addresses. Um, Trying to apply that to these other areas of opposition, but the people who are sitting in the way of the open market and, and people voluntarily exchanging what they choose to, um, the people who are standing in the way have these and addresses. And, and what are their arguments that they're using to validate the choices that they're making in the legislature? Let's leave that question open. Uh, it is time to move on to our our drug at. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I haven't smoked any marijuana since I started campaigning. So, how many folks here are baby boomers? You? Okay. Well, uh, we, we baby boomers basically owe the rest of you. Um, Made many apologies for all of the things that our generation have wrought, mainly the twenty trillion dollar debt. No, I've been voting libertarian all my life. That all of you guys are gonna have to deal with. I'm not talking about us personally, I'm just saying as a generation. Case of uh, marijuana uh, and in general drug legislation, there is one thing that could be ascribed to being our fault, but it wasn't something intentional. Um, this is fairly recent information that the, uh, of course, drugs uh, like alcohol were basically illegal for quite a long time. This wasn't new when we were growing up in the 50s and 60s, that was the case. Uh, 
Um, however, uh, under the Nixon administration, there was a dramatic move, and that is essentially the advent of the drug war, where the legislation was put in place that uh, seriously up the ante in terms of the kinds of uh, prison uh, sentences that were being uh, that were being given to people who were convicted of using or selling or buying uh, uh, drugs. So recently, and I'm not sure the exact provenance here, but uh, what I read online was that. Uh, there is uh, new information available from one of the people who was at the table when this was being discussed in the administration. And uh, the information is that essentially there was a, a motivation on the part of Richard Nixon himself to push this because he felt that it would be an effective weapon against African Americans and hippies, both of whom he considered to be on his enemies list. Famously, he had an enemies list um, because it would suppress uh, their ability to be full citizens and give them a hard time and basically pay them back for uh, demonstrating against uh, his administration with respect to the war and with respect to social policy. We didn't mean that for that event to happen, but <laughs> apparently we may have uh, helped, to, uh, helped to put that in place. Um, now, this is another case of unintended consequences, or maybe they were intended, I'm, I'm, if, you, if you believe that story about Nixon. I'm not saying that's necessarily true. It's just something I've heard. But it worked in the sense that the United States of America has the largest prison population of any country in the world. Now, we do have one of the largest populations, but there are certainly countries with more people than we do, and we have more prisoners than they do. Um, we also are number one in terms of per capita, obviously, in terms of per capita number of people in prison uh, in, uh, in the world today. And almost a majority of those people are drug offenders who essentially committed no violent crime. They basically were caught selling, buying, or imbibing uh, illegal drugs. And because of this body of legislation, this drug war legislation, that takes a lot of flexibility away from the legal system, the judicial system, uh, particularly if you're caught more than one, uh, more than twice, if you're caught a third time, there's a call, third strike, you're out uh, uh, concept involved in these laws. They put away um, if you can't beat if you can't beat it. Of course, what actually happens in real life is that if you're poor uh, or non-white the chances of you being able to beat one of these charges uh, is much less. If you're rich and white, you hire a good lawyer and you get off. Um, but otherwise, you're convicted of a felony, you're jailed, and when you get out, you're virtually unemployable for the rest of your life. It impacts, of course, not just you, but your family and, uh, and society, really, because uh, the potential that uh, you have as a productive citizen is severely uh, impacted. Um, the number of people in prison for drug violations since just 1980, uh, which was several years into the drug war, uh, has gone up 12-fold, 12 times more people in jail now than there were in 1980 for drug uh, violations. Now, of course, as we saw with prohibition of alcohol, the other exciting effect of this, uh, of this policy is not to reduce crime, but actually to increase it, um, not only in terms of, uh, of just regular people violating the law and uh, losing respect for the law, but in terms of organized criminal enterprise. Um, prior to the legalization of marijuana in Washington State and Colorado two or three years ago, the uh, DEA estimate was that approximately 60% of the revenue of the uh, organized drug uh, cartels came from the sale of marijuana. Now, they weren't necessarily making a lot of money on marijuana, but uh, the volume of the dollars that were flowing through allowed them to finance lots of other activities, uh, both illicit bad activities here in the United States, like um, people trafficking uh, and uh, bribing, <laughs> influencing uh, political situations uh, illicitly. And of course, a lot of that occurred south of the border, too. In fact. There are countries uh, in South America and Central America 
that where the situation is much, much worse now than it was in the 70s or 80s in terms of everyday life because of the violence that occurs related to, to, uh, to drug cartels. This has our demand and our dollars basically going south and being used to finance really bad things or else ending up in somebody's vault uh, in, a, you know, in the form of a gold nugget. Um, so the bottom line is that, uh, oh, and, and then of course there's the element of the fact that we need to spend money here to keep the people uh, in prison. Uh, that costs $30,000 a year per person. Um, for millions of people, at least half of whom are probably not really criminals from the point of view of a libertarian, we would say that someone that didn't commit a violent crime and didn't hurt anybody is not a real criminal. Um, so, uh, but nevertheless, we're paying $30,000 a year for each one of those people in jail. And on top of that, there's a cottage industry of keeping track of another four or five million people who are on probation and need to check in and uh, are, or potentially are getting arrested and not necessarily going to prison, but in jail for a while, and then they kill bondsmen, and they, of course, criminal uh, defense lawyers, and so on and so forth. So we're spending an incredible amount of uh, human energy and dollars in our society that could be allocated to something more productive if we didn't have this going on. Um, so our position from a libertarian perspective is that as a society, this set of laws is uh, essentially wasting money that we really don't need to be spending. We're treating people unfairly because, um, as I mentioned before, it's the poor and non-white people who really get the, the shaft in terms of the way this, the, uh, this plays out. Of course, we're exacerbating social issues rather than alleviating them in the sense of what Owen talked about with respect to encouraging people to, uh, kids to, to misbehave because it's an illicit activity. Um, and uh, we basically believe that the appropriate way to treat alcohol and drug uh, addiction is as a health issue, not as a criminal issue. Um, that way people actually get help for their problem as opposed to going to jail and learning how to be a better criminal from other criminals. Um, which is what's happening now. Um, plus, of course, instead of spending money on keeping these people in jail, we could be collecting money, collecting the money that's going now <laughs> to, 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 to South America, we could be collecting that money ourselves, either in terms of uh, individual citizens who are running, le hopefully legitimized uh, businesses growing and selling marijuana, or uh, in terms of tax revenue uh, to, to our government, so to reduce our, our need for uh, for taxing us in other ways. Um, so that's basically where we're at now. Um, there are some issues that uh, we, as uh, people who want to advocate this, need to address. There are a lot of concerns about if you loosen the laws, then there'll be more um, usage and more abuse. Um, the early returns from Washington and Colorado are somewhat mixed. There's been no huge increase in traffic-related deaths or anything like that. Doesn't seem like that's an issue. Um, if we only have a, about a year's worth of data that, that it's been legal in Colorado for two years, so there's some data, on, some data, scattered data on the first year. It's obviously going to take more than a year before we really know, because even as Owen was saying, it was. It was like took really five years to see what the impact was uh, with the prohibition. No, the answer to those questions is something you need to watch very closely. Um, but so far, the early returns are that it doesn't seem like legalization has created significant new social issues um, in either uh, Colorado or Washington. That's something that, again, we need to, to, to watch closely. Um, our basic philosophy is that, yeah, um, you know, you can pass a rule that says that somebody has to go to church, but if they don't want to go to church, if you haven't gotten them inculcated to want to behave in the way you want them to behave, then you really haven't achieved what you want to achieve in terms of getting people to behave better. Um, it's, it, it, it's the wrong, quote unquote, wrong way to uh, try to instill behavior. What we need is better education, uh, and we need better treatment for people that have addictive personalities, and, uh, we need to monitor that. 
Um, I've got a question for you, Brent. Shoot. Um, so, would you say that um, the perception of drugs um, has become more of a vice than it had been prior to the criminalization of marijuana? I know a lot of uh, drugs were used in tinctures. And, uh, little remedies and such like that. Right. Uh, cocaine used to be in Coca-Cola. Sure. So do you think that drugs have become more viewed as a cool vice than they were before the criminalization? Or do you I think don't they think there's a huge effect in that respect because drugs were really uh, already illegal and already had that kind of patina. You know, jazz uh, musicians used marijuana, but uh, there, was that, there was that image already existed, um, so uh, there's there's certainly some effect in that direction. I don't know if it's more than it has been. In, in, like you said, it's the kid wearing the, mar the marijuana T-shirt. I mean, absolutely, there, there's an effect, and hopefully, legalizing it will decrease that effect. But whether it's more now than it used to be, I, I don't know. I don't think so. Um, what is more now is that people's lives are being ruined and uh, respect for law is being uh, attacked because th there's clearly this demand and people are going to do it whether it's legal or not legal and, and uh, kind of ignoring that and, and trying to pretend that it doesn't exist is, uh, or uh, that you can control it somehow uh, is just the wrong-headed approach that has lots of negative consequences. Um, so, I would like to just suggest that in terms of the kinds of questions that uh, folks are asking about what the next step is, um, I think that's a very open discussion and, and uh, um, certainly as someone who's aspiring to get into the uh, North Carolina General Assembly, I'm open to suggestion as to what the right approach should be. Do we focus on medical marijuana first? Uh, do we, uh, do we talk? Do we emphasize the potential revenue benefits? Um, you know, what are the what are the right pressure points? Who's going to be in opposition? Uh, what the strategy might be for for moving us in the, in the direction that we want to go? Um, so, uh, Brian is raising his hand. Um, so, we're going to have an interesting sort of national uh, snapshot. Uh, you know, in November, California has on their ballot a recreational marijuana bill uh, that they'll be voting on, given their size and scope in terms of population across the nation. And North Carolina had a bill in committee, which has died in committee two sessions in a row. Uh, it keeps getting brought up. Uh, do you believe that the United States is really at what we perceive to be that moment where we're suddenly realizing, gee, this isn't the end of the world? We need to stop this prohibition, particularly in a state like California. Well, things are clearly moving in that direction. Absolutely, no question about it. I know Gary Johnson has been very vocal on that and making that point. Uh, so, yeah, I think it will it will help us that uh, if California does go that route, when California does go that route, because it's going to happen. I think like sixty percent. I think Arkansas has a bill that's coming up for. Who does? Arkansas. They had two, and one was just it validated as a ballot initiative by their Supreme Court. And in your original home state of Florida, I know that the last time it was tried, it didn't succeed, but it's going to go be again on the ballot. I'm not sure if it's this cycle or next cycle, but uh, probably it will pass the, second, the next time it's on the, it's on the ballot in Florida. Ken. Uh, I think people in disadvantaged communities have some serious concerns about uh, how police and members of those communities interact. And of course, I think as just citizens of the United States, we should all be concerned of our police forces. Does any of that uh, stem uh, either directly or indirectly from the war on drugs and how the United States or how individual states have uh, tried to enforce that? Yeah, that's clearly a driver. Um, I don't think it's the only driver, but it's but it, it clearly has pushed militarization of the police. That they. A lot of the uh, uh, hit teams, or what, what do they call them? The uh, SWAT team, right? The SWAT team uh, uh, originally uh, were formed to uh, to deal with well well armed drug dealers, um, and uh, of course, they use of SWAT teams has expanded now. They 
they use them for all kinds of purposes, but uh, um, that probably was the original the original driver there. Hopefully, if we do away with this whole body of legislation that that essentially requires us to put a million people in jail, that will decrease the need for that kind of law enforcement. That's not to say that a lot of all disappear, but hopefully it'll it'll at least decrease the pressure to push in that direction. Kind of along that line, um, I don't know if you've read about it in your research, but Portugal decriminalized everything cultures. They decriminalized marijuana, heroin, morphine, everything. They have closed 40% of their prisons, and there are half as many cops in the street now as there was before. And their drug use has not changed. In fact, it's slightly dipped a little bit, which I think is a, it's a great selling point for people for people who don't believe, they think we're all turning to stoners. Well, they think the whole country's gonna just gonna, the fact is, in the 1890s, 1880s, this was all legal. Our great great grandparents used morphine, used cocaine, used heroin, for it was an effective pain relief. They didn't turn into stoners, they didn't turn into drugs. It, it was it was frankly the the right wingers who just wanted to, but if anything, Portugal's shown that decriminalizing things actually makes the country safer and they have less deaths. We're running the drugs um, and, and fewer prisons. They're, they're actually laying cops off. So, um, I know slot teams. My uh, slot district teams. is a very um, heavily minority community with um, people from the Middle East, Hispanic folks, black folks. Um, so, it's a very mixed district. Um, and the message that I've learned uh, that resonates the most just by listening to my cons potential constituents, is the idea that the drug war is breaking African-American culture and the African-American family, and slowly, progressively, destroying uh, the co cohesiveness of the community. And as I heard that, and I started, I mean, it automatically resonated with me, and it fit in with, with my worldview, um, as I started talking about that with the neighborhood folks, they absolutely are on board with that idea. And it is true, when you extract, it's seven, it's 25% of African Americans have a felony conviction. And 50% of those are for drug-related offenses. Nonviolent drugs. Nonviolent drugs. So when you extract that high of a percentage from any culture, you have taken out leadership, You've taken out potential, you've taken out the family, you take, and you create what's called uh, generational effects, right? So um, in, in, in my piece, when I was talking about the unintended consequences, uh, when I saw, I also went to this uh, kitchen table meeting where there were a bunch of Republican conservatives, and boy, did I bomb that one. <laughs> I really bombed it, but since then, I. Because I bombed it, I really thought, what did I do wrong? How can I communicate that better? And one of the things, I'm not sure it's there yet, but actually I think um, one of the problems with immigration right now is the drug war in Mexico and South America. What we've, because it's criminalized there, the criminals have control of those countries to a great degree, not exclusively all, obviously. But it reduces economic <coughs> opportunity. So people fleeing the depressed economy, people free, fleeing the violence come to America where they can have access to social services. So we actually are creating an immigration problem for ourselves. So it's that unintended consequence and how does that really resolve? So that was something that's been a little bit more successful for me. I have a question. What do you think about the idea of rescinding the felony convictions of nonviolent drug offenders? Well, that's something I'm working for. Uh, I was going to Liberty on the Rocks every Monday. I'm going to stop, and I'm going to be going to an expungement program. Um, we want to try to get into the Hispanic community. They haven't taken it up as much yet. But rescinding uh, felony convictions for drug offenders, absolutely. We need to return their right to protect themselves. We need to return to all Americans as many rights as we can humanly do, no matter what it takes, almost. Brian. In your experience with the African-American community, yes, their families have been destroyed by 
draw the rents, but it's not, isn't the church, and I use that term generally, so strong in those communities, and there are many black ministers that rail against use of drugs. So, is there isn't there a problem there, or do you even sense that? I think we have what I call an obsession with order in America, and and forgive me for making generalizations. I think white America tends to have a greater obsession with order than the minority communities of America do. Um, I think. Um, in black culture, churches, where even though there is a strong instruction against abuse, dissipations in general, intemperance with drugs or alcohol or what have you, um, even though there is that, it's not. There's not moral outrage. There's the willingness to say you're still part of my family. You're still part of my community. We're not going to because you've created this lack of order. We're not going to put you aside. We still accept you as, and forgive me, I'm like white guy supreme here, but um, that's what I've noticed. So if there's somewhere, my beard at least. Um, so if if I've missed that, don't please don't take no, no, my words. That's just what I've sort of garnered. So, yeah, Ed. Oh, you're Rick. See, I'm gonna. I'm horrible. Rick. Not it. <laughs> <laughs> I just from North Carolina, from California, where Ooh. it has really been sort of de facto legal there for years. Uh, medical marijuana uh, prescription is so easy to get. You can go in there and say, My wrist aches and I need this. And they, they write your prescription and you can basically buy um, it. I kind of think that moving here, I'm thinking of like, what are the activism strategies you can take to to legalize here? That's a and, great and, question. <laughs> and why? And why? And maybe it's possible to tap into the money that exists in the tobacco industry. And you know that they have to be watching from the sidelines, thinking how are they going to get into this business? Yeah, that act, that presents some benefits and problems. Joy. I'm going to take the grand use <laughs> the tobacco industry point of view as a, I grew up on a tobacco farm. My family raised tobacco. We had subsidies for a long time. Those are gone. They are gone. There is no big tobacco anymore in the center on the lake. There's a, there's a, a pocket, a handful, like uh, one of the farmers that rents land from us has a grandfathered contract to supply tobacco. But that's it. There's no, there's no government money coming in. There's no big, there's not a cash crop anymore. There's no allotments. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna. The companies, the, the tobacco companies are. So let, let's address the idea of the benefit and curse thing. The benefit is yes, we could re-energize a whole industry with the sale of hemp. Uh, but, but I was going to say, the tobacco farmers I know, they are absolutely, no matter how old they are, all for industrial hemp. They want that to come roaring in to take the place of tobacco. So the problem, the curse is this. In, in states uh, such as Colorado, they basically want to take that and hand it to big tobacco. So those small companies, the small farmers, for whom it could be a wonderful boon, uh, in North Carolina, I think the last fee that was uh, bandied about was ten thousand dollars to be able to grow hemp. Yeah, <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah. So how does a, a tobacco farmer who's struggling to pay for his equipment and his farms back to <laughs> afford that ten k? This is all regulatory capture, right? This is the name of the game when it comes to right. Business so business and government. I think is the libertarian dream because we love to do that. Is um, is say yes? Let's get every small farmer be able to grow this tomorrow, free of fees and free of not. But the problem is, we may end up if we're not careful, just handing it to big business. Okay, and before I have one more other thing to say is that maybe there's also a framing issue over the whole cannabis situation, starting with the name marijuana is the racist name for, for 
It's not cannabis. marijuana. It's, it's cannabis. Yes. Yeah. Right. And so if we reframe the discussion, and then we might say, this is really a curve that should be regulated like tomatoes. I'm totally in. That's where I would be coming from. It occurs more naturally in nature than an apple tree. Yeah. It, it is a weed. Yeah. 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 It's for thousands of years. So it's, yeah, camera. Um, this is actually kind of more of a crazy question. Crazy comment, too. He goes off a number of <clears throat> comments. For the moral case of the you know, the families and the churches, I think this destroys them and all, and you know they need the government enforcement to help them. Well, that seems off, and that should be something we should point out against. Uh, typically, it's conservatives saying they're big family people, and they you know they run on it, and they say the family people they're all about family, but they're really big big families, and society is weak if they can't enforce morals upon each other. So that would be another thing is you don't trust families if you believe the government has to enforce these morals and norms upon them. To take back family from them too. We, we, I would take from your comment, uh, Cameron, that we really do need to set, and yours, we need a set of vocabulary that cuts to the heart of this matter. I think when Gary Johnson was on Stossel, or maybe it was just the CNN thing, yeah, the CNN he one. really... Even if he's been talking about this stuff for 20 years, man, and he stumbled around on it. We need to sharpen our vocabulary and sharpen our delivery to get to the heart of matter. And I feel like banning in my campaign the use of the word marijuana. But sometimes, depending on who I'm talking to, I say we. You're but yeah. one, one of the things you asked earlier was, was should we should we work toward medicinal marijuana in North Carolina or should we work toward recreational? And I think Rick kind uh, of answered our question is calling it medicinal is kind of a waste of time because it's so easy to get it. So right. maybe we should just go straight for recreational, but allow medicinal marijuana or cannabis to be well, the counter example is California, where uh, the camel's nose got into the tent using medicinal. So it might be an effective strategy to move us in the right direction, even though that's not where you want to end up. Right. So I, I let's bring full circle. The what happened with the Volstead Act was this idea. Let's uh, that the the light end of it. Maybe we legalize marijuana with a low THC count. You know. It's one of those legislative interns. That is. If, if you guys are looking for an issue, I think Fred asked the question earlier, kind of what is that? Uh, what, what issue do the Libertarian Party should focus on? I heard this observation, and I think it's very true, that North Carolina would be the last state to legalize any form of marijuana and cannabis, whatever the hell you want to call it, in the Union. Remember, North Carolina was the last state to ratify the Constitution, the last state to secede the Union. So, <laughs> I, I think hemp is our best. Hemp is what they are. If there was a list of But Brian, we're first in flight, so we must be able to buy. <laughs> we got by before anyone else. <laughs> <laughs> okay, folks, we're uh, seven minutes over. So uh, we're going to uh, draw this to a, a conclusion. I do want to point out that following the election uh, we in Wake County, we are planning to put together some groups that are going to focus on issues. One of them clearly will be cannabis. Or <laughs> <laughs> see, that, that's exactly <laughs> my point of trying to make. This caught me off. It shouldn't be cannabis. It should be an issue that we use to make alliances with other groups on specific pieces of legislation. But we should not waste our time focusing on something that's not going to happen in North Carolina. We're also going to talk about uh, transportation. We're going to talk about education. We're going to talk about all the issues that the Wake County, uh, the Wake County candidates have been talking about, and maybe more if some folks want to talk about additional issues. So look, look for that. Um, it won't be it won't be on November 9th, but uh, we are going to be organizing those those groups. So if you have an interest, uh, there'll definitely be an outlet. Um, I also should mention that Wake County has a number of citizen advisory boards, and if you're interested in looking at governance in the county, um, and or potentially maybe thinking about doing something political yourself down the road, that is a great 
way to start yourself down that road and, and get involved and, and see how government works or doesn't work as the case may be, uh, who the players are, and, uh, and get your name known. You won't get your name known in a public way, but you will, if you're active in one of these groups, become fairly well known within the circle of, of, ma of movers and shakers who are interested in that area. So, um, without further ado, yeah, so basically, thank you very much for uh, coming to this, our last uh, of the five uh, series of, uh, of, of presentations. We have one more meeting here at the Gourmet Factory scheduled. It'll be next Thursday, and at that meeting, we will be distributing uh, uh, material, yeah, swag and uh, motor cards for people who want to near on uh, election day at, at precincts, among other activities. Um, so if you're interested in that, please make sure that uh, you, you've signed up on our website. There's a volunteer page where you can sign up for that. Um, so you'll be included in distribution information about that. Um, after that, we're going to be nomadic for the rest of the year because we're testing out various places that our relocation committee have recommended to us uh, to as to where we're going to finally end up. And we are going to be running a poll. Uh, so um, if you have an opportunity to check these places out, either at one of our meetups, which are going to be mostly on Wednesdays because we're looking at moving to Wednesday rather than Thursday uh, in 2017. Um, that you can do that, uh, or else you can visit these places on your own. Um, that's perfectly okay, too. Uh, the, so the list will be, uh, I'm not sure if we have a list published anywhere, but they are, but we'll be putting one up. Uh, so anything else, on? That's it. Um, I just want to personally thank everybody. Ken, did you have something to say? I have a question. When is the next week LP meetup, and where will we be at? The next one is next Thursday here. The one after that will be the following Wednesday at the Oak and Dagger, which is one of the places that you, as one of the members of the relocation committee, have suggested that we try out. <laughs> and all this information, uh, in terms of when the meetings are, where they are, is on our uh, Facebook page, on the Meetup page for the Triangle, and also on the LPNC's event page. Would you comment on the uh, election night event? as well yeah, I was... okay yes there's going to be an election night event it is at uh five proof point like, oh, yeah what let susan talk about that because she's the organizer Actually, I've worked on with Wake LP, so I've had a couple of things about one is that uh if anyone would like to participate in vote making uh it, see me after work and we'll sit over there